uh, I at that time had never heard of Ben Stein and I was um, I had been duped uh, by a man called Mathis into taking part in a film which I thought was a serious um, exploration of science and religion that's what I was told uh, I only much later discovered that it was a creationist front uh, and that I had been fooled into doing something that I would never normally have done when I spoke to Ben Stein I took him seriously I thought he was well until the end of that interview as you saw um, I and when he asked me that question um, something like could you ever imagine any kind of intelligent design I bent over backwards to try to give intelligent design its best shot its best shot for me was uh, something like designed by an alien intelligence something like what Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel had proposed as directed panspermia I don't believe in that I didn't believe in that I never said I did believe in that but I was trying to bend over backwards to give intelligent design its best shot I was actually being even more generous than that because uh, knowing at the time uh, nothing about Ben Stein and just trying to give my, my, my honest opinion I recalled that Dembski the leading theorist of intelligent design at a time when he was trying to distance himself from creationism they, they are of course all straight down the line Christian creationists but nevertheless um, it was a time when for political reasons in American educational politics Dembski was anxious to distance intelligent design from creationism and he tried to help that distancing along by protesting that the intelligent designer doesn't have to be God it could be an alien from outer space Dembski said that I actually remembered that when Ben Stein asked me that question and I thought I was actually offering Dembski an olive branch by acknowledging his admittedly disingenuous suggestion that the intelligent designer might not be God but might be an alien from outer space so the quote mining in that case was even worse than uh, it, it appears now I do think that the question of is there life elsewhere in the universe is a genuinely interesting question and one that actually has theological implications along with most scientists I believe the answer to the question is there life elsewhere in the universe is probably yes although unlike most scientists I do have an argument for suggesting that it might be that life on this planet might be literally unique I'm a bit out on a limb there most scientists think there must be life elsewhere in the universe how rare actually is life in the universe what if it is so staggeringly rare that we literally are the only life form in the entire universe as I said I don't think that's likely but we can't rule it out we have absolutely not got the knowledge not got the information to rule out the possibility that life on this planet is literally unique there is no life elsewhere in the universe it does have an interesting implication since the number of available planets is up in the billions of billions it would follow that if life has arisen only once the likelihood of arising on any planet is staggeringly low and therefore when we on this planet speculate as chemists more or less has to be chemists speculate as chemists on how life on this planet might have started we would have to be looking for a theory of the origin of life so vanishingly improbable as to qualify by the ordinary standards of human judgment as impossible it obviously wasn't totally impossible because here we are we do as a matter of fact exist but if this planet is the only planet that has life then we are totally wasting our time looking for a good theory a plausible theory a likely theory 
for the origin of life. Because the theory of the origin of life that we would have to be looking for would need to be the kind of theory that we would ordinarily rule out as ludicrous, ridiculous, impossible. In 1950, the great Italian physicist Enrico Fermi was having lunch at Los Alamos with two colleagues from the Manhattan Project, and he suddenly said, where is everybody? And his physicist colleagues knew what he meant. Why have we not been visited by a superior civilization from outer space? Now, the intuitive calculations that Fermi and his colleagues were making when they wondered why we hadn't been visited, those calculations were based on what's called the principle of mediocrity. We used to think that the Earth was the center of the universe. Then we thought the Sun was the center of the universe. Then we thought the Milky Way was the entire universe. Now we know, or do we, what do we know? From our point of view, the point of the principle of mediocrity the point is that we've had our fingers burned before in history whenever we made parochial assumptions based on our immediate surroundings. The principle of mediocrity is the antidote to the temptation to think there's something special about us. We apply the principle of mediocrity to the origin of life and we conclude that there must be life elsewhere because why should this planet be so special? But in that case, Fermi wondered, where is everybody? There is a loophole, which is that the origin of life might not be all that improbable, but the origin of technological life, the sort of life that's capable of visiting us, either in person or by radio, that that constitutes a larger barrier. I've written down there four possible barriers to our being visited from outer space. The first of them is that the origin of life might be very hard to arise. I've already dealt with that. The second one is that technological life might be very hard to arise, to evolve, I should say. The universe may be full of life at a bacterial level of sophistication. That might be an easy thing to happen. Origin of life might be an easy thing to happen. But a subsequent barrier to producing the sort of advanced technology that would be capable of visiting us has not been uh, accomplished. It has been pessimistically suggested that technological life, when it arises, is extremely short-lived because it, con it, it almost immediately blows itself up. <laughs> So there could be little winking lights of technology going on and off around the universe. <laughs> and going off before they have time to start uh, exploring s space. Or, fourthly, it could be that technological life is too intelligent to want to bother to visit us. Now, the principle of mediocrity can deal with all those, those barriers. We can do the same kind of calculation for technological life as we did for life itself. And we can come to an equally paradoxical conclusion. I'm going to refer here to, I think, one of my favorite science fiction books, uh, The Black Cloud by Fred Hall. Has anybody read The Black Cloud? Not many, okay, none in fact, okay. <laughs> right. Strongly recommended, although the hero is a deeply obnoxious character. You have to just sort of get over that and, and learn some. It's one of those science fiction books where you really, really learn a lot of science in all sorts of, of different ways. It's like so, so much science fiction. It, it is about our being visited by a superior intelligence from outer space. And uh, if a civilization was technologically advanced enough to visit us, then it, wouldn't, then it would certainly have to be far more advanced than, than we are. No question about that. We are centuries away from having the technology for interstellar travel. And so if we are visited from, from elsewhere, 
we, the, the individuals, or whatever they are, whatever they call themselves, who visit us, must be hugely superior to us. So superior that if we were ever to meet them, we would be gravely tempted to fall down on our knees and worship them as gods. <laughs>